Hi guys, so welcome to another Keen Medic video. This is Vishal here, medical registrar in the UK. So today we are going to be talking about Darren's diarrhea. Okay, so in this video, we'll start off with the scenario. So we'll talk about Darren, what's brought him in. We'll talk about what you think, okay, what your differentials are and what your further management is. Then we'll have a closer look at the whole scenario and we'll do a scenario review. And then we'll go to the bite-sized bundle for paces. So where, you know, I'll be giving you all the right uh, kind of information in bullet points where it's easy to remember for you and you can revise for paces using that. Okay, so if you see this bell icon during the course of the video, stop and have a think. Okay, so come up with your own thing so that you can maximize uh, on the benefit from this video and you can think like a medical registrar. So this is essentially what we are trying to do. Okay, before we go to the scenario, I just want to tell you about this paces course online, which I have developed and I have published on my website, keenmedic.com. Go check it out. It will give you all the top scenarios that come up in paces a lot of frameworks and strategies that you can implement from right now up to your day of paces and loads of downloadable material that you can use from the moment you get the course okay so this is something of great value go check it out guys the link is in the description down below and to make the value even better use this code here youtube 15 so you get 15 percent off right let's carry on so, the scenario is, Darren is a 22-year-old man admitted with bloody diarrhea for the last six weeks with abdominal pain. So, quite a, young, quite a young man, abdominal pain and diarrhea for the last six weeks. Okay. Past medical history, he's a smoker. So, he's been smoking for a few years now. Um, so, other than that, he is fit and well, he's fine, he's working, okay? The ambulance crew have reported that his heart rate is 134. That's quite high. We don't know whether, whether you know, this is uh, sinus, not sinus, irregular. We don't really know. Blood pressure is low, 88 over 49. So that's worrying. So he's hemodynamically compromised here. Respiratory rate is 24 and SATs are fine, 98% on air, temperature is 37.1. Okay, so basically he is unwell, isn't he? So we need we need to really act fast when he comes to a &E when you are seeing the patient, all right? So that's the first thing you should be thinking about. You know, this is an unwell patient with bloody diarrhea and also um, he's a smoker, okay? So what are your differentials and further management? Have a think. Whilst you're having a think, make sure you click on the like button below, guys, because that really helps with the uh, video and it helps with the YouTube algorithm and pushes it out to more of your colleagues and friends so they can benefit as well. So once you've had a think, so these are the kind of differentials that perhaps we should be thinking about. Okay, young man, bloody diarrhea. Of course, infectious gastroenteritis should be right at the top, okay? So we don't really know whether he's been traveling or not at the moment, whether he's at takeaways, stuff like that. We don't really know at the moment. Inflammatory bowel disease is another one. So inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's, it can be either at this stage. We don't really know at the moment. Celiac disease, possibility he's had diarrhea. In any patient with diarrhea for some time, you should always be looking at celiac disease. TB is possible. Again, we need to know if he's come into contact with anybody, whether he's traveled to some high-risk areas or not. Ischemic colitis is possible, less likely in this age group, especially if he's got no other kind of risk factors such as atrial fibrillation, uh, heart disease, for instance. So it's less likely, but possible. He's a smoker, so you know he might have kind of arterial uh, disease there. Malignancy is another thing that you should be looking at, uh, but again, in this age group, other than a lymphoma, perhaps this is less likely. If this was, say, an 80-year-old patient, then, of course, malignancy is something you should have right at the top of your differential list. So, here's the story. He has had intermittent bloody diarrhea for the last six weeks, okay? So, it's intermittent, not constant, all right? Uh, and the blood is mixed in with the stool. So, you know, it's not uh, it's not separate. It's mixed in with the stool. So that's something to note. He's also had cramping central abdominal pains for this period of time, which are coming and going like the bloody diarrhea. But he's had no vomiting. Okay. So that tells you that, you know, he's unlikely to have had anything in the upper GI tract. So he's had no vomiting. 
he first noticed while on holiday in India. Okay, he first had this bloody diarrhea while on holiday, but after it came on, it resolved on its own, and then it's come back again. So that's another important thing here. So it's it's intermittent. Okay. And he's obviously traveled to India, which is a high risk area for things like TB. And who knows, maybe he's picked up something there. He's also felt hot and cold, another feature of an infectious gastroenteritis type picture. His clothes feel baggy and he's at weight loss. So weight loss is another worrying sign. So we, we need to explore this clearly. And he's possibly had some joint pains as well, although he thought this is due to tiredness. He's eating and drinking normally, thankfully, and we know he smokes. He smokes 30 a day, so he smokes quite a lot, okay? Um, but regardless, you'll see that smoking is quite relevant in this picture. He drinks approximately 12 units a week, uh, and he's had no binges uh, in the last few months, so that's fine. So a few a few things of note here. So he's had intermittent bloody diarrhea, cramping central abdominal pains, which are coming and going, first started when he was on holiday in India. Okay, so let's have a closer look. On examination, this is what you find. He clearly appears unwell. We know that his heart rate and, um, you know, his respiratory rate are compromised. His blood pressure is low, tachycardic and tachypneic, and he's had generalized abdominal tenderness. Okay, so his bowel sounds are increased, but there's no obvious peritonism that you can find. His chest basically shows, uh, has come up with vesicular breath sounds, a good air entry bilaterally, okay? There are no obvious rashes, synovitis, conjunctivitis of note. This is relevant. On his blood test, you find that his CRP is 239, so it's significantly raised, okay? So this is uh, very important here. Sodium is okay, potassium is fine, so rest of the liver functions are okay as well. Renal function is fine, I'm, I'll just tell you now. Uh, thankfully, because, you know, he's at risk of dehydration. Albumin is 40, uh, HB is 108, so he's anemic. So in a person who is 22 uh, with no other, you know, history of bleeding, this is very significant that his HB is 108. So he has got significant anemia, okay? Uh, and MCV is 98. So he's got normocytic anemia, white cells of 18.4. So his white cell and CRP combined are telling you that he has an acute inflammatory uh, phase here. Platelets are 380 and amylase is normal. So platelets are normal. So that tells you that it's not, uh, it's the bleeding is not because he's got bone marrow failure, for instance. Okay. His checks is x-ray basically it's fine. So there is no evidence of infectious changes. So that's, that kind of decreases the likelihood of him having TB. But you can still have TB in the gut, okay? So that doesn't rule it out fully. And of course, you need to get some kind of imaging. So you get a CT abdomen done, and that shows widespread skip lesions noted in the gastrointestinal tract. The terminal ileum shows radiological evidence of inflammation. There is no radiological evidence of perforation or malignancy. Okay, so basically his entire GI tract is inflamed with skip lesions. Skip lesions are where there are parts of the gut which are inflamed and other parts which are not inflamed. Okay, so that's what it means, skip lesions. So you will have heard of this term from your MRCP part 2 and your earlier training in uh, at medical school, uh, for instance. So this is classical of, I'm sure that you know the diagnosis by now already. It is Crohn's disease. Okay, he's got Crohn's disease. This is what he, this is what the situation is. So let's go back to Darren. Let's look at what has actually brought him in. So he is a current smoker. So this increases the risk, okay, of Crohn's disease. This is a known factor. It's a very much a recognized factor. He's had bloody intermittent diarrhea for six weeks with generalized abdominal pain and weight loss. So of course, in the context of uh, smoking, this increases the chances of him having Crohn's disease. But on top of that, he also has got travel history. So as the medical reg there, you would also need to look for things like infectious gastroenteritis and TB, okay? So you would need to send off the relevant uh, blood tests and fecal um, samples to look for all of, uh, all of these infectious causes, okay? You wouldn't be doing the endoscopy yourself, but you would be involving the gastroenterologist. Okay, you would need to ask their advice, especially after the CT abdomen has shown this. Okay, the skip lesions. All right, 
and he has got terminal ileitis with skip lesions on the CT. So all of this put together basically gives you a diagnosis of Crohn's disease. And here is the biceps bundle for paces. So it, with Crohn's disease, what you have is that you usually have a patient who is younger, in the, uh, less than 30, okay? But you have to remember that uh, with inflammatory bowel disease uh, and Crohn's disease, it's a bimodal. You have a spike of patients who are younger, but also a smaller spike where a more elderly population can get inflammatory bowel disease as well. So kind of 50 to 70, you can get a second peak. It's bimodal, okay? So th just because someone uh, who is younger can get it doesn't mean someone older can't get it. So that's another reason why you should have an open mind in PACES. And in real life, when somebody, say, in their 50s, 60s, comes in with uh, inflammatory bowel disease type pictures, okay, you still have to look for this. So in terms of the features, they will have bloody diarrhea with episodic nature. So they'll have acute exacerbation. So they'll have acute phases where they have got really bad active inflammatory disease. And then things get settled down. And then they will have it again, okay? So that's what tends to happen. That is classical of inflammatory bowel disease. Cramping abdominal pains, which will be generalized usually, and weight loss, okay? So weight loss happens because of their uh, significant diarrhea, because they're losing more than they are gaining, okay? That's why. But this is the uh, intestinal side of symptoms and features. They will have extra intestinal features as well. With the eyes, they can have conjunctivitis, episcleritis, stuff like that, okay? They can have joint pains, they can have pains in their hands and feet, but also they can have pains down their spine, so kind of like ankylosing spondylitis type picture. They will also uh, have skin changes, not all of them, but some of them can have things like erythema nodosum, pyoderma gangrenosum, and some may have clubbing as well, so you should look for stuff like that, okay? So you should get down on your knees, have a look for clubbing, and also look at their shins for pyoderma gangrenosum and erythema nodosum, okay? All right, so investigations-wise, you would do all the basic stuff, all the basic blood tests. The uh, relevance for CRP is that it is an acute phase marker for disease um, activities. So it is important to do that. If it's raised, then that tells you that there is high disease activity. CT and MRI of the small bowel. So you would need to do the CT first. You wouldn't do uh, the MRI straight away, not at this point anyway. Uh, maybe in the future, if you have high suspicion. But CT will tell you, you know, that there is inflammatory, uh, inflammatory disease process going on. Then you could potentially proceed to MRI if need be, if advised by the gastroenterologist. But Really, you also need to be thinking about other things like fecal pro calprotectin. So fecal calprotectin, it's it's a, a small protein uh, you can find in the uh, feces. So if it is raised, then that is that basically raises your suspicion for inflammatory bowel disease. And colonoscopy is what you really need with terminal ileal biopsy. Without a biopsy, you can't really make uh, a definitive diagnosis, which is why you need to do this uh, colonoscopy. So you need to get the gastroenterology team involved, okay? So that's that should be your top priority, involving the gastroenterology team. In terms of risk factors, we've already talked about smoking, so that increases the risk of having Crohn's disease, of developing Crohn's disease, uh, by two to three times at least. And there is a genetic factor as well. So if your family member has got inflammatory mild disease, you are at a higher risk of developing it, as well as taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, these are also known to increase the risk of uh, Crohn's disease. In terms of the management, so there are a couple of basic things that you would need to do. These would be things like a smoking cessation. You would need to emphasize on this. You would need to get the patient some help if they are keen to stop smoking. Pain relief, of course, you know, they will have cramping abdominal pain, so you need to get on top of the pain. So symptom relief is always important, as well as controlling the underlying disease. Speaking of controlling the underlying disease, in the acute phase, they will need IV hydrocortisone, okay? So to, um, to essentially dampen the acute phase down, when they first present, you need to give them IV hydrocortisone in A&E. 
After that, after you've achieved some kind of control, you will need to think about the steroids that they would need. So these would be things like prednisolone and budesonide. Again, this is the, this is the stage where you would be involving the gastroenterology team, okay? After the initial management with uh, IV hydrocortisone, steroids, perhaps IV antibiotics and pain relief as well, you would need to get the uh, gastroenterologists involved. They will be the ones initiating longer term steroids. And in terms of add-on therapy, this is more for your discussion and paces. Um, you would need to think about azathioprine or uh, mercaptopurin. These are five ASAs basically, okay? And before you start them on these, you would need to check the uh, levels of thiopurine methyl transferase levels, so TPMT levels. You need to check them, otherwise you can get uh, significant uh, life-threatening bone marrow suppression with azathioprine, for instance, okay? Monoclonal antibodies are again initiated really by gastroenterologists. You need to be aware of the different variations. The most commonly used one is infliximab. It's a TNF alpha inhibitor. You would need to also look for evidence of TB before you start patients on these because you can get reactivation of TB uh, if you don't if you don't look for these things. Okay, some patients may need surgery if their disease is limited to the distal ileum only. Because if, if, if you imagine with Crohn's disease, you get skip lesions, okay? So there are areas of the bowel where there are they, they are affected, but some of them are not affected. So you can't take the entire bowel out. You can't do that. So that's why if, there, if the disease is only localized to the terminal ileum, then you can take it out, okay? Complications wise, there are a few things that you will need to know about. So obviously this is a chronic inflammatory process with acute exacerbations uh, affecting a lot of the bowel. So there are a few different complications. Bowel obstruction secondary to strictures can happen. This can happen acutely or subacutely. Fistulae. So fistulae are basically tracts which communicate one one lumen, one area that's open to another. Okay. So this can between this can happen between two areas of the bowel. So there can be a tract between two areas of the bowel, or this tract can happen between a bowel area and to the bladder. Okay. Or this tract can happen between the bowel or the vagina in ladies, or it can happen between the bowel and the skin. Okay, so a lot of different possibilities here. So in these sort of situations, you would need to involve the surgical team to see if the if they need intervention. Perforation is another possibility, especially when you know the bowel is friable, inflamed. The bowel can perforate. Um, that it's also possible if they uh, go into obstruction, and if it is really significant, they can have perforation as well. Anemia and hemorrhage can happen is if they have got uh, acute exacerbations and, you know, they are significantly anemic. And there is a recognized increased risk of colonic carcinoma with Crohn's disease as well. So they will need some kind of surveillance uh, by the gastroenterology team. Lastly, but definitely not the least, they can develop osteoporosis down the line. So I hope this is useful, guys. Uh, take a screenshot, uh, go through this again, come back to this video and make sure you go and check out the course linked in the description below. Use the code when you are uh, going to the course and getting the course for yourself. I will see you in the next video.